On today's photo moment, we're going to be talking about XML. I know, really exciting stuff, isn't it? But we're going to see how to record and modify macros for your ATEM switcher. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photojoseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. At least that is the plan and we usually stick to it. It's a live show. Everything you're about to see if you're watching this not live was recorded live. If you are watching it live, then you already figured that part out. And if you are here live, then that means you can participate in the comments, which is super cool. There is my YouTube comments over there. And look at this. I even got my Twitch comments coming up. Not that anybody's over there, but, you know, just in case someone shows up. And um, I kind of almost sort of have it set up so I can see the... Facebook comments, but that's kind of a mess. So I, yeah, we're you know we're working on that. It's Facebook doesn't make this easy. Anyway, if you're watching live and you have questions throughout the show, pop them into the chat. Make sure you type "Photo Joseph" in front of it so that I see that it lights up right on my screen, and I know there's a question. I'll do my best to address it in the Q and A that comes up after the main show. So today's show is about how you create and modify macros for your ATEM, your Blackmagic ATEM switcher. Now, I realize there's about six people out there who actually care about this, so the fact that there are as many of you in the live room right now watching this is just, like, amazing. Um, it, this doesn't apply to most people, I realize, and, but if you actually have one of these switchers and you are going, how in the heck is it that I'm supposed to automate and do these macros, then you'll find this educational. If you just find it interesting to see what goes into the show that is produced here, because all of this, everything you're seeing here goes through the ATEM, then, uh, then you know, it's just going to be an interesting show and hopefully it'll be kind of fun. So good morning to everybody in the chat room. Hello, Marco and Andrew and um, a Chinese name I cannot read. And uh, thank you for participating today. Okay, so... Let's first talk about the, the essential core of how you create a macro in here. Very briefly, I'm going to show you the screen. This is my switching interface. This is what I would use if I was doing everything manually. And I would push on these buttons to switch between different cameras, um, fade in and out between, uh, between one side or the other preview or the, the a program, add in you know my media player, pull in images or graphics, overlay lower thirds, things like that. I've got a media pool where I can access all my graphics. I have an audio panel where I can access all my audio. And then, oh crap, didn't mean to launch Photoshop. And then I've got um, the camera. So that these, this controls all the different cameras that are plugged into it. So there is a lot going into this. And this interface is, is well, you just saw it's, it's not exactly intuitive and no. It's old school. Right, the design of this thing is very, very old school. If you came from a manual switching world, then this is just like cake tea. This is, you know this, you love it, you've been breathing this thing forever. But when you don't come from that world, as I didn't, looking at this is, makes your head, you know that emoji was the head, that's, yeah, that's exactly it. So it took me a while to figure this out, and that's why now that I've really gotten my head around, I've been using it for a couple of years now, and I know how to do, how to make this thing sing, really, um, I wanted to share one of the most important parts of that, and that is the creation of macros. So the interface you just saw, I could go over here and switch up the show by clicking on these buttons here, right? Load up my chat room, my iOS interface, my uh, Blackmagic camera, whatever. I could load those up here. But the problem with that is that that is going to do one thing. It switches from camera A to camera B, and that's it. It wouldn't necessarily load a lower third if I wanted it to do that. It wouldn't load a preset split screen and so on. You can, If you were on a... Um, if you were the operator for a live show, so not like I'm the operator and I'm the one on camera, then you'd have a little bit more flexibility because you would load things up into the preview. You would take time to load things into the preview pane and say, right, we're going to put this, we load this graphic, we get this thing queued up, we're ready to go, and then we hit live and it takes all that and moves it over. I can't do that, right? I can't be sitting here going, okay, well, um, next we're going to switch over to the monitor and then I hit go and it's, it doesn't work like that. I need it to be automated. So macros are essentially scripts, macros are scripts, that do a whole bunch of things at once and set up everything you want it to be, the way you want it to be set up, and then loads it to the program. The program is what you're seeing. The program out is what you're actively seeing right now. So it would load it in the preview and then send it out to the program. And I can make that all happen in a split second. Or one macro, it just runs the whole thing and it goes. And that's a, that is exactly what all this is. So when I do, even if it's something simple, like switching to the close-up camera, oh, that's exciting, uh, switching to my overhead camera there, switching to the studio camera, which I just realized I actually failed to turn on this morning. Very clever of me. Let's get that thing activated because I'm going to need that later. Um, when I, All of that is controlled through macros. But things like loading up my YouTube chat, when I bring this up here, what you're seeing is something called a super source. 
super source is up to four different camera sources loaded at once and this is cropped in a very specific way you notice i'm shifted over so if i stand right in the middle of the frame right here and i go back to the main picture i'm still in the middle of the frame so it has taken this and moved it over uh, moved i guess that way cropped it uh cropped the other screen the computer screen that's coming in overlay that and so on so all that happens at once and i have pages of these macros on here and i'll come to this whole part of it later Okay, so that's, that's essentially what this is. That's what we're doing with macros. Now, if you look at most live streaming interfaces, like for example, the Perl, the Epifan Perl 2, which is what the hardware that I'm using to do the streaming. Remember, my setup is really, I did a video on this a while ago. We'll link to that up here. My setup is a bit overkill, um, <laughs> but it's awesome. And if you had an Epifan Perl 2, most likely you would be feeding all of your sources into the Perl. Right? You would take your computers, your cameras, your audio, and feed them into the Perl. And within the Perl, you have a very, very nice, easy, comfortable interface to design your layouts, your screen layouts. Everything that I just showed you here, I could do all of that in the Perl. I, had the, I got the switcher first, and I was using software to do my actual streaming. Um, then Epifan sent out the Perl for me to evaluate and loan, and I've been able to hold on to it thus far, which is awesome. Um, I, you know, I keep on telling you guys about it because it really, really rocks. The quality of the encode that I get out of that hardware is way, way better than what I get out of software. So something like Wirecast, which you know, kind of sort of works, the hardware is way better. Um, I'm not utilizing the Perl, all the Perl switching capabilities. I'm doing all my switching before that in the, uh, in the Blackmagic ATEM, and then sending that out to the Perl. Anyway, if I was using the Perl, the setup for all of my different screens, like this would be really easy. It's drag and drop. You can you grab the corner of a window in the, with a mouse and resize it, crop it, change the ratio, reposition things wherever you want. And then you go, okay, this is the layout that I want. And you basically hit save, and that is the layout. And I could do series of these. I don't know if there's a limit or not, but anyway, I could do a whole bunch of these, and then I could just load up the preset when I want to. And that's really, really easy. The way that it works in here, though, is not that way. You don't set everything up and then hit save. You have to actually record the building of it. You have to record the process of building it, which sounds insane, but there is a real advantage. And I want to take a moment to explain the advantage of one over the other. Because when I first started working with it, I just I was like, this is just ridiculous. There's no reason, rationale for this. It should be so much easier for this. But the more I understood it, the more I realized that the complexity with it allows for a certain amount of power and flexibility that you don't normally have. So let's look at two different ways. Let's say that we're using a system like the Perl or anything else where you set it up nice and easy and you hit save. For the vast majority of people in uses, this is perfectly fine. But let's, uh, let's just do a simple setup uh, example. Let's say that I do a picture in picture. Um, actually, even easier than that. We're going to switch to camera one, right? We switch to camera one, this camera, with my audio on. So I go in and I set up camera one, audio on, and I save that. Boom, that's saved. OK. Now I go to, um, to camera two, which camera two is going to be my computer. OK, and I switch over to camera two, and I, uh, I set camera two with audio on, and I activate that, and I save that. So now I've got camera one with camera one audio is a setting. Camera two with camera two audio on is a setting. OK, well, now let's say uh, the way that I usually do the show is I go from a title slide to the opening image, which is me, camera one, with the audio, and then I switch over to the computer, camera two, with the audio. And now I've got audio activated on both. But if I forgot to save to actually activate audio on camera one, when I built the preset for camera two, it wouldn't be there, right? It would actually turn off when I switched over to that. So now I gotta remember, okay, I have to, when I'm setting up camera two, I have to make sure that camera one's audio is actively on as well. And that doesn't sound like a big deal thing, but it can be a big deal thing as you start building lots and lots of different presets and you may not necessarily go down a path from first I'm going to go to camera one and then to camera two. If one day you decide to go straight to camera two and you didn't build in the preset to activate audio on camera one, audio on camera one isn't there. And you're going, why can't anybody hear me? Again, I realize this sounds a little bit obtuse, but as we go into my demo that I've prepared today, you'll see a little bit more understanding of the, of the, uh, the flexibility of not having to build everything and hit save, being able to just literally build the pieces that you want. So um, with that said, the way that we do a record, and we, the way that we create a macro in here is essentially to hit record and start actively doing the actions. And that sounds really, really bizarre. But what I've found is the most effective way to do this 
is to set things up the way that you want them as your final, I would say it's a picture in picture setup. I set everything up the way that I want it. And then I hit record and I effectively turn everything off and back on again. Or if there's a crop setting, a position setting, I just nudge the numbers, I call it, I tickle it. I'll go you know, up a pixel, down a pixel, and then that records, it doesn't record the movement, it doesn't move it up and then down, it records the final state. So it records that final state of on, it records the final state of, um, you know, scaled to 0 .6%, 0 0.6 size, 60%, that sort of thing. So it saves that final state. And so I have to go in and I tickle every component of it that I want. And that, that's effectively how I go about building it. So, um, so that, that's what we're going to be seeing today. So now how am I actually doing today's show? This is one of the, the paradoxes with doing this. So if I switch over to my desktop computer here, my laptop computer, if I was to click on, let's say, SuperSource right now, or just another camera. Let's say I switch on, right now it's on demo, that's this computer. And let's say I, I click on BMD1, that's Blackmagic 1, that is the main camera. If I clicked on that, you would effectively, as soon as I clicked on it, you would no longer be seeing this screen, right? Because I would be telling the program out, that's what you're seeing, to switch to that camera. So you couldn't see me actually operate this, anything that I did, uh, anything that I did on here would immediately switch over and show you what I was doing. So it doesn't really work. And I finally figured out how to do this. So let me go back to it. What I've done is I've modified my presets so that instead of when I click on, when I bring up the preset that you're looking at right now, so this screen, you are not actually looking at my normal switching system of having my screen going into the, um, uh, through the Perl, uh, through the ATEM into the Perl through its normal program out. I am sending you a direct auxiliary out from one of the six, I think it is, auxiliary outputs that this hardware has, and I'm redirecting just this screen completely separate from the main program. Like, what? What are you talking about? L let me show you this. Let me go back to here. If you look at the top of the window here, you'll see that I have a series of uh, six auxiliaries, so, and they can be renamed. So there's a chat feed auxiliary, the Perl, that's auxiliary, Studio Confidence Monitors Auxiliary, there's two that I'm unusing, and then the program to Studio One, which is, it has to do with how Studio One cameras run. It doesn't matter. Anyway, Perl 2 is what you are normally looking at. Instead of sending out the Program 1, the Media uh, ME1 program, Miss FX1 program, which is what you normally would be seeing, instead of sending that out, I'm sending out just the demo screen, just this screen here, which means I can now go in here and I can click on buttons in here, and you are seeing me actually click on the buttons, whereas what I'm seeing in front of me is I'm seeing all these changes happen. But what you're seeing is just this screen. It's a really interesting way to do this. And I finally figured this out last night. So that's how I'm doing it. I have built macros now that don't just switch the layout of what's going out to the program, but actually switch entirely what is being sent to the Perl. Wild, but that's how this is done. I looked at a lot of different videos and it seemed like nobody had kind of gotten how to do this. They'd put cameras over their shoulder and stuff like that, but I figured out a much better way. So that's really cool. So I just thought I'd share that just in case you're wondering. Okay, I know it's a huge rabbit hole. Trust me, I know this. Okay, so let's get back into it. Let's start with recording a, a actual macro. I'm gonna do something really, really simple to start. I'm just going to go from uh, to a single camera switch. So we're looking at demo right now. We're gonna record something that switches over to BMD1, which is, again, my Blackmagic. That's my standard camera. And we're gonna ensure that the audio is enabled. So the way that I would record it is I go up under the macros and load, load up the macros pane. And I'm gonna find a blank page on here. I've got a ton of these that I'm not actually using anymore, but we're gonna take a blank one here. Click on one and I click on the plus. I'm gonna call this um, live live demo good job uh, one. And I'm gonna copy this to the clipboard because that'll make it easier for me to find later. And I hit record. Now that it's recording, I can actually just collapse this and kind of hide it out of the way. So now whatever I do is going to get recorded to the macro. So we're gonna say switch over to BMD1. So that records that camera switch. And I wanna make sure that my audio is turned on. So I go over to audio and you'll see in here the audio panel I'm not actually using most of the audio here, my audio is being routed through another box, through the Behringer XR16, which is then being fed into the XLR. However, you can see, here's my, this GH4R that stands for GH4 Remote, that is my close-up camera. It has its own built-in microphone. You can see that right here. We don't want to be hearing that, so it's not turned on, but you can see the audio. This is my overhead camera. It has its own microphone. We're ignoring that. We don't want to hear that. Um, this RCA input is actually the house music that you hear before the show starts. That is, there's an iPod that's plugged into that, so it's just on a permanent loop, and so that is what's there. And then the XLR audio is what we're hearing here today, and you can see that that one's lit up and colored, and you can see it bouncing as I talk. You also see that it's on. So if I turn this off, 
and then back on again, you probably heard it went totally silent because I turned it off. So by turning it off and back on, I have tickled this. I have now said that is on. So the only changes I've made is turning on the audio and going back to the switcher, turned on this camera. That's it. That's the extent of my macro. I'm going to stop recording this. Again, it's set for live demo one, and now we can run it and test it. And so let's just do that. Let me turn, I'll just set up a different audio, a different uh, picture here. We'll set up, go to chat or demo, it doesn't matter, just anywhere here. And then I want to run this macro. So I go to run, I click on recall and run, and this is the one that I want, live demo one. As soon as I click this, you're going to see this change over here. Click live demo one, boom, it just changed, and there it is. Pretty cool, right? So that is all there is to it. That has now recorded that as a script. So let me uh, jump back to the main camera here. So now that I've recorded that, what do I do with it? Well, it's a button, but if I wanted to modify this, this is where I have to get into the XML, which gets a little bit crazy. So um, I'm going to now save this out, open up the XML file, and show you what the actual code looks like. And this is important because once you understand what the code does, you can start borrowing code from other scripts. You can copy and paste pieces of code out of other scripts to add functions in without having to re-record them, which is pretty cool. Why am I getting sounds in my ear? I have no idea where that's coming from. Oh, are you hearing that? You are hearing that. Mm -hmm. Ryan, mute the audio coming in off the chat system, please. Um, okay, so now let's go back to the system here, and I am going to save my scripts out as an XML file. The way I do that is I go to File, Save As, and you'll see here that I have tons of these because I make these all the time and I save them kind of as backups as I go. Uh, my files, the, the file name automatically gets a date and time appended to it, which is great. So my protocol is I just click on one of the existing ones that brings up the name. I delete the name, name and uh, date and time off of it. And then I hit save. So that is now saving. We will see it. It is going to offer me to save everything. I don't want to save everything right now. I'm only working with the macros. This will make for a much faster save and a smaller XML file, make it easier for me to deal with. And in the bottom right corner there, you can see it shows the saving status. So it's, it's not instant. You know, it does take a moment while it writes that XML out. And there it is. It's complete. So now let's uh, switch over. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to make sure that I, set, I have this all set up. Right? Let me quit Photoshop that spontaneously launched because I accidentally clicked on it. And get this box set back up again. Um, and just, I'm sorry, I just want to rearrange my screens a little bit here. All right, there we go. So now, go back to this. Um, I'm going to launch... Uh, Text Wrangler. That's the app that I like to use for doing my modification. Um, main reason is I can see, it just kind of makes it easy to see the code in here. So that's not actually the right project. So let's close that and open up the one I just saved, which is right there. So there's the one I saved, see 9.48 a.m. That's today's show. Open that up. And this is the code. This is what I've got. These are all my macros in here and just the macros. Okay, so I need to find the one that I just did. Remember how I copied it to the clipboard? So I'm going to hit Command F, hit Paste, Live Demo 1. That's the one that I did. I hit Next, and it finds it. There it is at the bottom. So this is the code. That's it. Index 84, that is the number of the button. That's the 84th button. There's the name of it, Live Demo 1. And then we see what it's doing. Program input, that is the program. That's the show that you're seeing, program out. Um, mix effects block index 0. So this, I didn't really explain this earlier, so let me just do this very briefly here. If we look back at my switcher, you'll see there's a Mix Effects 1 program and a Mix Effects 2 at the top. This switcher effectively can program, uh, can control two different shows simultaneously. I'm not using two at all for anything, so everything I do is on one, uh, but it just shows the buttons up there. So Mix Effects 1 is there. Now here's one of the real conundrums of this system. <laughs> this is one of those where you go, how is this possible? So I have ME1, Mix Effects 1, ME1 and ME2, 1 and 2. What did the code say this was? Let's look at that again. The code showed it as ME0. So the code is ME0 and 1. When I'm building anything with graphics, if I look at my graphics, let's zoom in, let me show you this again. Um, if I go back here and I look at my media placeholders, my graphics, see still, it's called a still store. There's still 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 30, actually, can I even more? Oh, up to 32 stills that are stored in here. Um, that's not still number 1, that's number 0. That's number one. That's number two. So everything is minus one number. The interface shows everything starting at one. The code starts at zero. For everything except for cameras. So camera one is actually camera one. I just, just I don't, I. Legacy. That's all I can say. Anyway, so let's go back to this. So back into here, there's my code. 
So my code said program input, setting to program, uh, ME1, mix effects one, which is called zero, and input camera five. So that camera five is the camera that you saw. And then also audio mixer input, that's my audio mixer, um, input external XLR, and then turned on. So if I went in here and I said, you know what, I actually wanted to turn that off, I could just type off in there, and I've just changed the code, so now when I switch to this camera, it would load that camera up and turn off the audio, if for whatever reason I wanted to do that. So that's the at the most basic level, that's what this does. So I would go in there, hit record, record a uh, series of actions, and then save it. And I could reload that. I could rearrange them. I could change it, move it to a different slot in the um, in the the button layout. I could, I could, you know, well, rename. I could combine pieces of it. So if I wanted to, uh, let's say that when I switched over here, I have it turning on XLR audio, but ooh, I want to make sure that it turns off the RCA audio. Right, let's make sure, let's build it so that it turns off, that's the house music. We'll build it in so it turns that off. So if I've already recorded that RCA one somewhere else in here, I could simply go in here and I know I have, so I'm gonna just do a find for RCA. And there's one right there, um, audio mix input type, external RCA off. So I could just take that line of code, copy that, go back down to the bottom, paste it into place, and now I've got that line of code added into that script. So that's, that's essentially all there is to it. So this is on the really easy level, obviously. Next, what I wanna do is show you a much more complex one. We're going to build something that is much bigger, that's gonna require a lot more of the tickling that I talked about, turning things on and off to save their states. And I'm going to specifically not record the, uh, not tickle one of the components that I need so that I make a mistake and I screw something up and you'll see the um, both the benefits and the kind of drawbacks of doing it that way. So that's what we're going to do next. Before we do that, let me just bring up a couple of house ads here real quick. I want to remind you of our value for value proposition that we have here on the show. If you are learning something from today's show that is actually putting value into your life, then please, by all means, consider putting value back into mine. Head over to photojoseph.com support. There's lots of different ways you can provide value into the show. There's Patreon, PayPal. You can shop at the affiliate store. Uh, you can uh, view my content on lynda.com. And, uh, and of course, you can hire me directly if that's the sort of thing that you might need. Well, we also have things like a workshop in India. We're going to India in January. And incidentally, by the way, let me just tell you this right now. Um, get the right screen up here. I've been asked by a few people if I could extend the early bird payment program for India. So by the way it was set up, you could save 10% off of the entire package price if you paid in full by June 15th, that is today. I've been asked if I could extend that. So I'm going to extend that to the end of the month, June 30th. So if you've been thinking about this and that 10% is going to make a difference, which obviously it will, um, then if you can book into the trip and pay in full by the end of this month, you save 10%. You don't have to pay in full by the end of this month. If you'd rather just put down a deposit to hold your spot and then pay off later on, that's totally fine. But if you can pay by the end of this month, then you get to save 10%, which is great. So I've been asked if I could extend that, so I'm extending that to June 30th. So if you're thinking about going, you kind of hemming and hawing over it, now you got a little extra time to figure that out, go take a look at flights and so on. And of course, to learn all about the trip, head over to photojoseph.com India, where we'll tell you everything, everything that you want to know about it. Um, also, if you are a GH5 user, I want to remind you of my GH5 training. You go to gh5training.com. And of course, if you are a beginning photographer, probably not likely if you're watching this show, but if you are, uh, if, you're, <laughs> if you're watching this episode, but if you are, you can head over to uh, my Linda course, uh, my Photography 101. Oops, that's the DIY one. Um, that's my 101. Well, that's okay. We'll just put the DIY one up there. DIY photographer, that's one. I've also got a photography 101. I got all kinds of photography courses over at lynda.com. You can go check all those out. So, you know, please do. All these different ways that you can help support the show um, and learn something along the way. So, all right. Now, we're going to do the big, crazy, complex one. Let me make sure. I'm going to check a look at my notes, make sure I haven't forgotten something. Um, we did that. Oh, yeah, you know, there was one more thing I wanted to show you. So, you may have noticed. Let me switch this over here. Um, actually, let me set this up. Let me stop what's happening right now. Okay, so let's say um, I'm, I've got this on screen. You're watching this. I'm going to switch back to me. When I tap the button, you're going to see an orange box for a moment, and then it switches back to me. That orange box, that outline around the screen, is telling you that a macro is actively running. So most macros run virtually instantaneously, so that will essentially flash. But you can build a, a delay, a hold, if you will, into any of your scripts. So you, it's called a sleep, actually. You can build a sleep into it, and it's counted in frames. So if you want a one-second sleep and you are doing a 24 frame per second show like I am, then you put in sleep for 24 frames, and it does. And you can make that sleep as long as you want. So I use this in a lot of different places. Uh, one of the most notable ones is the lower third thing that's going to pop up off the bottom of the screen here in a couple of minutes. That is set to be triggered 
after I think it sleeps for three minutes or something after I switch over to this screen. And I've adjusted that over time. It used to be it came up within a few seconds of it. So every time I switch this camera, the thing would pop up. I realized it was a little bit annoying. So I delayed it. So right now, if you look back at my screen, um, I, if I trigger it now, it'll disable the macro that's actually running right now, so you won't see it. But there's an orange box on my screen right now. It is actually actively running that macro. It is in the sleep state right now. And once it's done, once it runs out of that, then it's going to run that little animation. Um, now, one of the things, the other things that I use it for is a very slight delay after I press the switching button, but not for all cameras. And here's, here's why. This is kind of a cool little clever thing. So let's, uh, you can see me right now, and you can see my hands. So I'm going to reach over here. Let me put, uh, let me get something in, in view here of this other camera. Um, there we go. I'm going to switch over to my close-up camera. So you see me reach over and tap the button. And the instant I tap the button, this comes up, right? So you've, you saw me tap it, and it comes up. But when I switch to the main camera, you don't see me tap it. Now, there's the obvious, OK, well, the camera was here, so you couldn't see me tap it. But watch my hands. Watch what's happening here. You see me reach over, tap the close-up. That's there. OK, now I tap the main. How is it my hands are already here? Well, any time I switch back to a camera where you can see me, not just the close-up over the overhead, I put in a half-second delay, giving me time to get my hand away from the button so you're not, at every single camera switch, seeing my hand here. If it, there was no delay, every time it switched cameras, you would see my hand here. And so I've built in a delay, so I have time to get my hand back. I can't build in a go back in time delay, so you are always going to see me reach up to switch to the close-up camera. But when I switch back again, you don't see that. Now, that's pretty cool. Um, I'll show you here. Let me do it like this, too, so you can see. Let's go to this close-up. So there's the close-up camera right there on this. I'm going to tap main, and you'll see after I tap it, it takes a moment. There it is. So you saw the delay in there. Pretty cool, right? So that's another place that I use the delay or the sleep. OK, I just wanted to share that with you because I thought it was kind of a cool thing. Um, all right, so now we're going to build a much more complex setup. We're going to build a super source setup. Super source is something that is only in the bigger ATEM. So if you've got a smaller one and you're going, where's the super source? This is why I bought the 2ME. This is why I spent all the money on this so that I could do exactly what I'm going to show you, have multiple images up on screen at once uh, coming in from all the different sources. So let's switch over to this. Super source is enabled by hitting the SSRC, super source button. So I turn that on. And then my super source is controlled under the super source. So here's the list of all the controls. There's my super source controls. I've got presets that are built in here, art that's the background. And I can copy if I've built a complex box on box two and I want to copy to box four, I can do that, which is pretty cool. We're going to spend our time over here. Now, there are a couple of presets listed already in here. There's a little four up, uh, four up where things are scaled, um, a two up, and then a three up that's cropped. And these are just pre-built into here. So let me show you what these look like. I'm going to switch over to this. You're now looking at the 4-up, and this is just kind of the default 4-up that's there. I'll switch over to the 4-up with the smaller window, so you can see what that looks like now. Um, here's the 2-up that's pre-built in, and then here's the 3-up with the crop. And that's just pre-built in. It's got, I don't even know what sources it's using for that. It's probably just in order. It's just That's just what's built into the system. It's just so you have a starting point. But I need to obviously change this up. I need to make this useful for me. So let's build a 4-up. So I'm going to go back into here. I enable super source. I go to the four up. And I am going to now look at each individual box. So I have control over box one, two, three, and four. Each one of these is enabled. Box one is enabled, and the source is currently chat. I'm going to set that to, I'm going to set that to camera one. That's my main camera. So now let me switch over so you're seeing, you are now seeing the output of that. So you're seeing the super source. You're seeing duplicates of camera one, because I've only set the first camera one. And, um, and that's what I've just changed. So now, let me go back to this, and I'm going to change box two. And I'll set box two to my close-up. And so there's the change that I've just made for box two. So there's box two in the close-up. So you can see now which is box one. And so that's, that's box one there. Um, whoop, there we go. There's box two. That's box three. And there's going to be box four. I think that's right. So now let's go back to this. And I'll say, let's change box three. Um, box three is set to close-up. We're going to make that overhead. And then I'm going to go to box four, and that is already set to studio oops, Studio one. So that's what I want that to be. So now there's the four up layout that I've just built. I can change the background color. right? So let's go back to this, and I go to my art layer. Fill source is black. Let's, I can set the fill source to be another camera. So I could go, um, I don't know, let's just do the same camera. Let's go to Studio one on there. And now as I switch. Switch back over to here. There we go. So now you can see the background is actually another camera. So I could do that. Obviously a little confusing, probably not ideal. So let's set that. I can go black or let's set it to color. I have two color palettes. I can go to color one. 
And then I can go up here to the color generators and there's color one and I could change the color on that. And as I'm changing this color here, what's actually happening on the output there, you can see that the colors are changing in there. And I could actually record this, right? If I wanted to animate the colors shifting from red to green to blue or whatever, I could record that. It's not gonna record me dragging it, but what I would do is simply set a color, record that, give it even a one frame delay, one frame sleep, and then record a new position of color, record a one frame sleep and another position of color. And, and that would allow me to have a fade over time of changing color, color changing from one color to another. There's all kinds of things you can do when you start integrating the sleep command into it. Anyway, get a little ahead of things. I just, I just wanted to kind of show that with you. Um, so, all right, so let's go back to this. Um, I've set it to this lovely green color. Um, let's just change that to something slightly less hideous. And, uh, and away we go. Okay, so there's my color set. So now let's just say that this is the layout that I want. This is what I want to switch to. I want to switch to this layout with the four up, those four cameras, with that color set in the background. So now I need to record my settings. And I need to record it and tickle it, tickle each setting that I want to save. So this gets a little bit tedious, but it's how it works. So let's go over here. And I'm going to bring up my record macros. Command Shift M is the keyboard shortcut that brings that up. I'm going to go into the Create tab, click on a new one here, click plus, and we're going to call this um, Four Up Demo One. And I'm going to copy that to the clipboard because I'm going to need that later to find it. And I hit record. So first things first, activating SuperSource. Remember, if I don't click on SuperSource, if I don't activate SuperSource, then there is no SuperSource. So I just it doesn't matter where I go to. I just need to activate it. So I can go. I can click on anything that I want to. But click on SuperSource, that's the last one that's saved, and that's what I want it to be. Okay, SuperSource is now active. And I'm not going to click on a preset here because this preset will change what I've already changed in here. That's not what I want. But I go into each individual box, and I go box one. Let's make sure that it's on, so I have to disable it and re-enable it. So that is just enabled box one. I want it to be camera one source, so I switch it from anything else and then back to camera one. Now I've recorded that. And then I go into my positions, and I'll just type on the uh, um, keyboard. I'll go up arrow, down arrow, and all that's done is adjusted the number, but it has now recorded that. Unfortunately, I cannot hit tab, super annoying, so I have to click on the next one, up and down, size, up and down. Cropping, it's disabled, so you might think, well, okay, so I don't need to worry about it. But I do need to worry about it, because if I just leave this, if I don't touch crop right now, and before I load this preset, before I run the script that I'm recording, if the one before that had a crop, that crop would stay there. This is the reason that you have to record every single step. So if I don't want it cropped, I have to actively say, no, I want cropping off on here. And you'll see in the code when we look at it, the cropping will actually be turned off. Then let's go to the background. I want the background to be color one. So I got to switch away from something. Color bars, I'll switch back to color one. And I could in here now also go in and record what that color is. I'm not actually going to do that though. I'm setting it to color one, but I'm not going to define what color one is. And that would allow me to change the color of the background, switch over to this preset, and not have to have the background color change. So I could do it either way. All right, so I have just set up uh, camera one, box one rather. That's it. Now I've got to do box two. So box two, disabled, switch camera from something else back to close up, up, down, up, down, up, down, and crop is disabled. Um, next one, let's go to box three. So again, Enable, disable, it's going to be overhead, so switch away and back to overhead. Up, down, up, down, up, down, crop is off. Box four would be next, but I'm going to deliberately not do box four. Okay, so now I hit stop, stop recording, we're good. Let's save this, command shift S to do a save as, get rid of the macro palette. Click on a name to load up my previous name, just delete all the date stuff afterwards, hit save. I only want to save the macros, hit save on that and away it goes. So now that is saving out to an XML file, which I will shortly be loading up to edit. Madness, yes, but this is what it takes. So we are now, uh, see that is done. We're now going to go in and take a look at the code that I just created and, um, and then rerun it and see where I made a mistake because I didn't set camera four and what the consequences of that would be. So let's go back to, here we go, to this. Um, swipe over, that's the old one, close that. We're gonna save that. Let's open up the one that I just created. There it is. And I need to find the one that I saved. So remember, that's on the clipboard, four up, double one. And there it is at the very bottom. All righty. So now let's take a look at what this code says. Let's just run through it very quickly, line by line. So program input, that's the program. That's what you're seeing the program out, is set to super source. Done. So remember, it didn't record when I switched to black into something else in the back. It just recorded the final state. If, incidentally, you wanted it to 
record the switching, like you actually wanted it to switch to camera one and then switch back to camera two or whatever, then you put in your sleep, right? Switch to camera one, sleep for a second or whatever you want it to be, and then switch over to the other camera. If you put the sleeps in there, then that is effectively a pause, a hold, and you can record multiple camera switches within one, uh, one macro, right? Neat. Okay, so they're switching to super source. Um, source box enabled. Notice, and this is one of the things I love about using Text Wrangler for this, when I, because it's made for doing code, um, I clicked on sor super source box enable. It has now highlighted the other super source box enables that are on this page. So I can see the three. So there's um, box index zero, that's box one. Box index one, that's box two. Box index two, that's box three. And these are all enabled. True, true, true. Notice there is no box four because I didn't do it. Then we look at the input for box one. Input, well, box zero. Input of box zero is camera five. The position of box zero is X position is minus 7.58 and the y position is 4.25, and the size is 0.41998. Notice incidentally as well, the number, the size of the numbers in here, you can get much more precise by doing it in code than you can in the interface. The interface will only allow you to two decimals, here you can do it more. Probably not usually necessary, but I have actually found in color, color balancing the main camera, I found the position that I wanted they got it just right was somewhere between two of the possible settings in the software. So you could actually write that exact position into the code into a macro and load it up that way. Crazy, right? Okay, so back into it. Um, mask enabled. So there's the mask. Remember I talked about cropping the masking? It's false because I don't want that mask to come on. So I want to make sure specifically that it turns off. Of the art fill input that is set to color one. Now you notice this, I did this, this is in order, right? I set up box one, then I set the color, then I set up boxes two and three. I do not have to, it doesn't really matter where this is. I could put this at the beginning of the script or at the end of the script. However, what I will say is that there have been times where I've been troubleshooting things and there's a, a flicker on screen, like one frame flicker. What is going on? And what it came down to was reordering the commands. Because if I have a really long script, it will take potentially more than one frame of video to execute the entire script, more than 1 24th of a second in my case to execute, execute the entire script. And so it would load something, and then let's say um, a 25th of a second later, it would finally get to another state, and so we might see something change for one frame maybe before it gets to the end of the script. And so what I found I would do is do things like, uh, let's say I was loading up the color. Um, here's a great example. If we go back to this, Right now, I've sold it to switch to super source and then load all these things up. Let's just say that this simple command, it would never be, let's just say this simple command was running so slowly that I was actually seeing these cameras all come up. I don't want to see that. So instead, what I would do is I would take that first line of code, switching to super source, cut that, and paste that down at the end. And now it's going to do all the setup first, and it's going to do all that invisibly, and then it's going to load the program. And if even there it was too much, like it just for whatever reason that, that I was still getting a flicker in there, I could add a one frame sleep. So yeah, I would find, let me just search for sleep in here. Search for sleep because I've got tons of them in here. Um, I'm just gonna grab one of those lines of code. So here we go, macro sleep is set to 15 frames here. That's just one that I'm using. So I could take that, copy it, go back down to the very end, oops, back to the very end to the one that I'm working on. Here's a four demo one. And I could go in here now, and just before it loads up that super source, I can put in a sleep, and I would just say, do a one-frame sleep. That would allow me to have the system build its setup, take a breath, and then load it up. And that one frame is unlikely to be noticed by anybody, but it was far less likely to be noticed than something flicking on screen that shouldn't be there. So, so one of those little tips, one of those little gems that I found in doing this that has really made a, a been beneficial. Okay, so I've set this whole thing up. I'm actually going to get rid of that sleep. I don't need that in there, so let's just get rid of that. Oops. Uh, when you're messing with the code, make sure you get the whole line. There we go. And uh, I'm going to save this. Okay, so I've, the only thing I've changed in here is to move that switching to the end. That's fine. Um, and yeah, we're going to save this. So now I'm going to save this document, do a save as. The reason I'm going to do a save as is because if, let's say I've done a lot of changes in here, maybe I screwed something up, right? Maybe I, I, I don't know, I broke something. I want to have my last saved file, my last saved XML file, able to be loaded back up in. So I'm not going to just hit save. I'm going to do a save as so that I have that backup of the last thing that I saved, the last known working XML file. Right? Good, good advice, good idea. So I'm going to do a save as, command shift S, save as. My personal way that I do this is I go to the timestamp at the end, 
So it was saved at 10.04 and 45 seconds. It is currently 10.10 a.m. So I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to change this to 10.10 and then two zeros at the end. And I just, you know, I know that's the one that I saved. It's obviously the one when it's going to be the most recent. And by putting the zeros at the end, it's just kind of in my head. It says that's one that I manually saved. Okay, so I hit save, close that, switch back over to the software control panel, go up here and restore. It's called restore. I don't know why, but it is. Hit restore. There's the one that I just created, the 1010, and I click restore. I can, incidentally, if this had the entire program saved into it, I could turn everything off and only load the macros. Um, in this case, the macros are all that's there, so everything else is disabled. I'm just going to load the macros. I hit restore. We see a restoring status down in the bottom right corner. Um, we'll give that a moment for that to restore, and away it goes. So now we are loading that XML file back into the hardware switcher sitting up there on the roof. Whew, man. A lot. I know. I don't know how my Friday shows always end up being big long shows. I know Ryan's in the other room going, why is Fridays always so long? Okay, that restore is complete. Um, now we can load the code. We can uh, load the button. So let's go to this. I'm going to bring up my macros, Command Shift M to load up my macros. And I'm going to go to the run mode, recall. So the difference here between recall and run, if I turn that off, I would select it and then hit play. Um, or I can hit recall and run. And now as soon as I click it, it's going to actually play it. So um, let's see here. How are we going to switch this up? So if I switch back to, how do do this? well, I'll just hit the button. I'll just play it. So I hit play on that. You see the super source pulled up on here. And if we go back to seeing what it's outputting, there's what it's outputting. So it just loaded that super source. Now remember, I've told it to use the color, but I haven't told it what color to use, which means I can now go in here and let me go in and change the color. So let's do well, here, I'm, you've seen me change the color before, so now I'm just going to change it here. So I'm going to go to a different color. Okay, so now it's, it's a yellow color. Now I'm going to load up a different macro. I'm going to tap my screen here and load up my main camera macro. So we're back to that. And now I'm going to load up that 4-up demo macro again. And you see my background color hasn't changed. It rearranged everything. It loaded the background color, but it left the background color where I had last left it because that was not written into the code. Okay, so now remember... I made a mistake. I did not record an action for cell number four, pane, whatever it's called, um, uh, box number four. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to manually mess up box number four. So uh, I'm just going to put it on four um, and I'm going to move it. So let's just do this. I'm going to move it, put it off into space on here and make it a little bit smaller. And okay, so I've just changed four. And yeah, so I've just changed four. Now, I'm not going to load up another macro uh, that's going to overwrite four. So four is just where it is right now. I load up another macro that goes to my main camera. Um, I'll load up another macro that doesn't use box four, like my YouTube comments one. And now I'm going to run the macro that loads up that four up. But because, uh, so incidentally, actually, this is really good. So this pane you're seeing me in right now is box one. The pane that's over there is box two. So those have been rearranged from the what the macro four up macro that I created is. Um, box four hasn't been touched in here. I load up that preset for box four. So I go recall and run, I hit up four up demo. I see and box four is totally gone. So box four, it actually was used apparently. And I don't even know where it is right now because it is not where it's supposed to be because I didn't tell this block of code, this um, script, where that should be. So let's say you make this mistake and you're like, oh my God, now I got to re-record everything again. It took me so long to get everything set up. I got to re-record it all again. You don't. You only have to re-record the portion that's missing, and then you go into the code, and you copy and paste the code around to get the right pieces where you want them. So let me take a quick look at my notes, make sure that this is actually where I'm supposed to go next. Um, and yes, yes, I'm on track here. So now we're going to record this. So I'm going to do record a new macro, but just for pane number four. So let's go back to this layout in here. And um, let's see, I'm going to start by running the demo. I'm gonna uh, running that script. So it's all run, run, run my four up demo. It loads up everything that it should, but it's missing the one thing. So box four, you see box four is actually disabled. So I'm gonna enable box four. There it is. Now I need to put it where I want it. So I can do this manually and reposition it manually, or I could borrow numbers from the other boxes. So if I go to um, say, let's see here, box three. Box three is Yep, so here, if we, if we let me show you this. So there's box three. That's box three. So I can borrow some of the data from box three and some of the data from box two and just kind of copy and paste the numbers over into box four. So um, we'll go to box three, the X position, minus 7.58. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to, let's go ahead and switch back over to here so you can see this. 
I go to box four, and I'm going to pop that in there, but I'm going to have to make that positive. I think I'm doing this right. And let's see, did I do that right? Uh, super source back on, box four. I think I got that right. Um, size could be 0.4. That's what the other one was. There we go. Size 0.4. Oh, no, it wasn't four. What was it? Um, box three. It's 0.42. Okay, so we're going to change that to 0.42. That makes that big. There we go. And uh, the vertical position, we're going to grab that from box two, which is 4.25. So now we go down here and we type in 4.25. Oh, negative 4.25. And boom, it positions it into place. Okay, so that is where I want that to be. And yep, so now we've got that in place. So now let's go back to this view. I'm going to record a macro just for box four. So we'll go into create, click on here, create um, box four demo, copy that to the clipboard, hit record. And now box four is what I want. We'll toggle that, tickle it, switch something, and back to studio one, change the size, up, down, up, down size up down. I'm going to do the crop thing even though I could copy and paste that code out of somewhere else but this just keep it all nicely together and that's it. Stop recording, do a save as, close out the macro. At this point you know it might be clever to uh, name this what I'm doing but I'm, I'm keeping track of it in my head so I'm just going to save all that, deselect everything except for the macros and hit save. So now that it's saving out I will open up the code, pull out the code that I need, insert it into the macro where I want it and that's all there is to it. It, it, believe me. I mean, you're like, that's all there is to it. I get it. Uh, believe me, I get it. I've been doing this for years now. Uh, last night, I spent probably an hour, hour and a half in here messing with the code to build up the presets for today's show. And a lot of it is, I don't want to say trial and error, but a lot of it is you run it and you realize, oh, I forgot to do that. And so you got to add one more line in there. Oh, I should have it. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Or you start to get creative. You're like, oh, wait a second. If I do this, then I can do that. And I put this here. It's... I realize this is a disturbing word to use with this, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> Whatever. Alrighty. So now that is saved. Let's go back over here and open up. Of course, uh, where's Text Wrangler? We're going to open up the last code that I just saved and find, paste in my box for demo. And there it is. So there is my demo in there. Super source box enabled. True. So I don't actually need, oh no, box three. I'm sorry, I do need that. Box, super source box three. I need that. That's turning that one on. That's box number four here, label three. Switching to camera six and the positions that are in there. So let's just take all this and copy that and go to, so it's just above it, right? Yep, 86, that's the one I'm doing. So we're going to go to the end here, paste that in. And now what I'm also going to do is I'm going to verify that my numbers are actually the same. Because remember I said before that they're limited to two digits. Um, I want to make sure these are actually the same. So 4.25002, yeah, that is the same one that's being used there. Um, Exposition 758, 758, 758. Yeah, so these are all accurate. I just want to make sure they're consistent. And if I wanted to clean it up, I could. I could, you know, let's just make that exactly 4.25. Um, I can totally do that in here if I wanted to. Um, so there's like that one's 4.25 exactly. I want to make this exactly 0.42 size, 0.42% size. Um, I could do that. So I can, you know, make these little tweaks in here if I want to. Um, it's all looking good and clean. We're good there. Um, yeah, okay, we're good to go. All right, sweet. So now we can save this. Command Shift S, save as. Remember, we're saving as, so we can always go back just in case I mess something up. We go to, uh, what time is it? It's 19 after, so we hit 19, 0, 0, hit save. It saves that out, and we're done. Go back over here, Command R to restore, load up that last one we just saved. Macros are set, hit restore, and let it load up. And that is all we're going to have to do. So now, once this is done loading, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up my panes again. I'll load up some of my other uh, other macros that I've already created so that it moves. It'll actually disable camera four. That's what it turned out it was doing before. It hadn't moved it. It had disabled it. And then I'll run that macro, the new one we just finished building, and it's going to put everything where we want it. So restoring is 100% complete. You see that on there. Um, restore, at the bottom, restore at the bottom right corner. It says restore complete. Load up my macros. Box for demo. That's, oh no, uh, box up demo one. That's the one that I want. So run recall and run. We're set and ready to go. And let's see here. I'm going to show you a different output. And now I hit this button and boom, there it is. Voila. And that's it. And now we've set it up and the box four is where it's supposed to be. And that's all there is to it. I know, crazy, but true. This is how it works. And it's extremely, extremely powerful. 
take a look at some of the buttons that I've got on here, some of my, my scripts on here. Um, I'm going to do, oh wait, no, I can do it on here, that's right. Let me load up the um, uh, same macro app that I'm using there. I'm going to load it up on this machine because this one is tethered into the switcher and I guess I can do it from here. And let's go um, iPad me. There we go. Okay, so there's there's the iPad. That's This is the interface. Normally I have it running on a different iPad, but it can run on this iPad because it's the one that's hooked into the switcher. Um, what you're looking at here is an app from a company called Strata. They make a couple of apps for ATEM switchers themselves. I've already linked to these down below. Um, they're not cheap, but when you compare to what this thing is, um, it is cheap. So there's two apps. That's the remote one. And then uh, our macros, sorry, not remote. It's called Macros, Strata Macros. And then there's Strata Pro. Strata Pro is almost complete control over the switcher. And up in the top of that, there is the macros, so I can load up the macros. They then developed a version of this that is just the macros, which I was very, very grateful for. Um, and that allows me to have the much bigger macros on, macro buttons on screen. Incidentally, if you're using this and you're wondering about the color coding in there, they did that for me. That was my request. I asked if there was any way to differentiate the buttons. And what they've done is in the description part of the code, actually, we should show you this. If we look, if, you're, if you've ever done this before and you're looking at um, how, to do, how to do colored buttons, we go to the very top of this, you'll notice if you put in the description, in parentheses, the color, that button becomes that color. So we've got, it's not any color you want, but there's blue, green, red, yellow, and white, and purple, I believe, are all the colors that we have. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. And they, like I said, they did that because I asked for some way to do it, and, uh, and that code is in there now. Just goes to show, if you, got any question, if you need something from a developer, just ask. You never know. They might actually be able to put it in there. Um, okay, so Ryan, some of you got troubles on the computer in there. Oh, well, that sucks. Okay, so let's go back to this. All right, so here's my button layout. Just to show you what some of these buttons are. Uh, the ones across the top, the ones in blue, are my four main cameras, right? The main camera, the close-up camera, the overhead camera, and the studio camera. That's the studio is the one behind me there. And then there's the two green buttons, comments YouTube and comments Twitch. So what that does when I tap comments YouTube, it loads up my screen on one half of it and the uh, my chat screen on the second half. And actually, here, let me... I do this. Um, <laughs> very meta here. Let me show you the right screen. There we go. There's okay. There's the screen that I'm looking at. This is the TV that is mounted in front of me, and you'll see that I've got the Twitch comments on the right and the um, uh, YouTube on the left on there. I can actually swipe over, and then there's there is uh, Facebook as well. Um, great. So I see this on here. So now this is on here, but when I load up my comments. What, it's, what I'm looking at is half of that screen and half of me. And then when I load up the Twitch comments, it's the other half of that screen and then me. Kind of neat, right? So let's go back to this. this. This is the same thing, right? What you're looking at right now is partially the iPad. The iPad is not 16.9, it's 4.3s, which I realized the other day gives me room to squeeze me in here. So I just got to stand in the right place, a little tape marker here, and now I am on here. So when I'm doing a demo on here, I can be going back and forth like this without having to constantly switch, which is kind of cool. Um, I have... Setups in here like, uh, well, iPad mains that you're looking at. Then there's iPad V plus main, so that's in the bottom left. And that changes the different crop ratio so that if I'm doing something on the iPad that's vertical, which actually this app doesn't go vertical, but there we go, vertical, um, that's how that works, right? Pretty cool. This, oops, let me get my um, macros back up. Go back to the main one there. There we go. Uh, there's the Lumix menu picture in picture. So you know when, I'm, when I've got my camera attached to the system and I show you the menu of it, but the menu shows up in the top right corner. That Lumix menu picture in picture is taking a crop that perfectly lines up with the output that comes out of the Lumix cameras and then repositioning that up in the top right corner of the screen. If I load it right now, what you're going to see is a portion of the iPad on there because the iPad is running into the same interface that I would normally switch this into. So I can't run both the iPad and the camera at the same time. I just unplug it, plug it into here, and then that's why that's where that comes up. Um, so all these different scripts. And then oh, here's another good one. This is kind of cool. Let me go to the second page on here, and you'll see the purple ones. These are all my media placeholders. So it's loading up the media player, and then it's loading in a specific graphic from one of these still stores. Remember I showed you there were 32, I think it was, stills in there? It's loading up one of those. So I've got my value for value, the India um, ad. All these different buttons are just there. So I tap on that, and it loads it up. Um, even audio. So the two red ones on screen there, decimator, audio, on and off. The decimator is the scaler that my iPad runs through or the camera would run through. 
I can toggle the audio on and off separately from that because if I want to play a video, let's say from the iPad, you need to hear the audio. I got to turn the audio on. If, however, I plug this camera in, the camera has a mic, that audio would be looping through. I want to make sure I turn that off so there the audio is off. And by default, it's off for me. So by default, the audio is off. I have to consciously turn that on to make that sound come through. And there's all, you know, there's all kinds of like a three up setup. Here's a three up if I'm doing a three up thing. And I could, I mean, there's just tons of them. That's what all this does. It's insane. It's incredibly powerful and it's a lot of fun. So we're going to wrap it up there. Um, do we have questions? This has been such a long show. I feel like we don't really need to do a Q&A. Um, I haven't seen anything come up there. Just type yes into the chat real quick if you want me to do a Q&A while I'm doing a final wrap up here. If there is, then we'll do it. If there isn't, then we won't. Um, Let's see here. Since we're doing it, since we're going to hold on for that for just a moment, I'm going to put this up again, the value for value. Please don't forget about that. If you've learned something from today, then head over to photojoseph.com slash support and throw out a helping hand. Um, another thing, this Leica promotion, this is about to end. It's actually two days from now. June 17th is the last day of this. So if you have been thinking about buying a Leica lens, do it, do it now because the deals are about to go away. Um, if you're going to shop for a Leica lens and you're going to buy something from um, B&H or from Amazon, I have affiliate links. Please use those links. Those links do not cost you anything else, and they do put a little bit of money into my pocket, um, and that, of course, helps run the show. So if you go to that photojoseph.com slash support page, you'll see links to all the affiliate stores from there, and that would be awesome. Um, and everything is, only things coming up in the comments, people saying they have no questions. So we're not going to do a Q&A today. We're going to wrap this up, and I will see you guys back here on Monday. I hope that was fun and interesting and slightly entertaining um, and educational for those of you who actually use this hardware. I will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.